Good morning everyone. Today on this sunny Saturday, I am here at Churchill's for a really awesome event. We are here to see raptors, reptiles, and mammals. It's hosted by the Center for Wildlife. So let's go see some awesome animals right now. They are all wild, so they all did start out in the wild, um, and something happened to them to make them non-releasable. So these are animals that we cannot release back out into the wild. These first couple of ambassadors that we're going to introduce for you guys are both birds. We treat about a hundred different species of birds at the Center for Wildlife. There are a lot of different birds that come through here, so we will treat any of those. Um, anything from a tiny little hummingbird all the way up to a big eagle will treat. Um, and that means that our wildlife rehabilitators have to have a lot of knowledge about all of these different species, about their care, about their natural history, about their husbandry. So these guys are all treated specifically for their species. I'm going to introduce you guys to one type of bird today called a raptor. Raptors are our big birds of prey. So these are the big birds that hunt for meat. They hunt for their food and they're carnivores. They're also incredibly intelligent and because they're so smart and so food motivated, we have found that they make wonderful, wonderful ambassadors. That's what we call all of these friends you're going to meet today are animal ambassadors because they are representatives of their species. Um, so just quickly before we get started, um, this first guy, they all rely on um, the care of our community. We have an operating annual budget of $360,000, and that's all supported by our local community. We have no state or federal funding for this work. So uh, if you guys are interested in getting involved with the center, I have a ton of information over here. If you guys would like to come up and visit, uh, we also have a lot of different ways that you can get involved. So volunteers are always appreciated. Interns, we're always looking for interns. Um, there's a ton of information about that all over here that I will have at the end. So I'm going to get out our first lady. She's really um, a wonderful ambassador. I'm going to remind everybody about our, uh, our, about our few rules for a raptor staying quiet and still. That's really going to help her feel very secure. These guys are pretty common in this area. If you were driving on 95 or 101 today, you might have seen one of them because they they love to be near our roads, particularly high up in a tree, scanning the road for food. And actually, we're going to learn a little bit about how to keep these guys safe from this lady. Hi. Step up. Step up. Good girl. Nice job. This is Ruby. Ruby is a red-tailed hawk. So one of the most common raptor species that we have around here, but incredibly important for our ecosystems. Good thing we're on tile. <laughs> um, they're incredibly important for keeping our rodent populations down, for keeping animals that we consider to be pests under control, like mice or squirrels or woodchucks, things that we don't like to see in our gardens or in our homes, these guys are eating. So they are incredibly important for our ecosystems. The reason that they like to be near roads is actually because our roads very closely mimic their natural habitat. In the wild, these guys would love a big open field or meadow where they can soar above and scan for food or sit up high in a tree and look out over the meadow for food. And our roads really closely mimic that habitat. So they have been attracted to the roads by their design but also by something that they find on the roads. Raise a quiet, nice hand. I know it's Saturday, but let's use our school rules. Raise a hand if you've ever seen an animal that got hit by a car. Yeah. So these guys are known to go after roadkill. They will go and eat some of that 
roadkill on the side of the roads. And usually that roadkill is there because they are either trying to cross the road because that road is in their habitat, or they were attracted to the roads too. And they're there to get their food as well. Also, let's raise another quiet hand. Has anyone ever maybe thrown an apple core or a banana peel out of the car window? There's no shame in it. I used to do it too. So if you if you have ever done this, raise a quiet hand. Anything thrown any food out of the window. So this is something a lot of people do. They don't think of it as littering because it is biodegradable. It's going to be a snack for wild friends. It'll go back into the earth. So not a lot of people think about this as being littering or being bad. But it actually is attracting our little critters to the road because they want to get all that food. And that means that they are put in danger and they are more likely to get hit by a car and become roadkill. And then that attracts birds like Ruby to the road where they would like to get some of those little animals either before or after they got hit by a car. These guys are incredibly stubborn. Our red-tailed hawks are used to being the big tough guys out there. They're a big bird. So they are not too, uh, they don't really know that cars are going to do a lot of damage to them. I've been on uh, one of the beach roads in Rye, driving down along the road and a red-tailed hawk was in the road on some roadkill. I had to get really close to my car, laying on the horn before it would fly off. They're very, very stubborn. So these guys do get hit by cars quite a bit. Ruby here was hit by a car. She broke this uh, wing over here. You can kind of see it droops. She is not able to fly anymore because of that injury. So she can't go back out into the wild. We very often see our red-tailed hawks making big circles in the sky. Their nice broad wings with those finger-like feathers at the end help to catch the wind so they can soar without flapping or using too much energy. So she is not able to do those things and now she will live with us at the Center for Wildlife for the rest of her life because of that disability. She has an enclosure and an enclosure mate at the center named Red. Um, the two of them are both similarly disabled. They both have wing injuries, so they have lots of ramps and ways to get up high into their enclosures because they aren't able to get up off the ground themselves. So they both will live at a, with us at the center. Um, these guys are raptors. Raptors are just one type of bird. There are many types of birds out there, and we are fortunate to get a lot of them in this area. We actually, on Mount Agamenicus, are one of those main hotspots where we see lots and lots of birds migrating. They use Mount Agamenicus as a flyway, so as a landmark <laughs> to help them on their journey north or south. So we get lots of migrating species of birds, hawks included, um, especially in the spring and fall. So our red tails are somewhat migratory. They will go down to the southern half of the United States during the winter. But more and more, we're seeing them sticking around up here as it gets a little warmer, as there's more development, more animals on roads for them to eat. They are sticking around up here during the winter more and more. They've kind of learned how to stay warm. They hunker down and they try to keep their toes warm with their feathers. So as long as there's plenty of roadkill for them to eat, they are sticking around up here during the winters. So they are a little less migratory than they used to be. A lot of our birds are changing their behaviors with the changing of our seasons and of our climate. So these guys as raptors have a lot of the things that make a raptor famous. This sharp curved beak Ruby has is that first thing. They use that kind of like a knife to help them when they catch a prey animal. They'll use that like a knife to help eat it. Usually they're eating things like squirrels or chipmunks, which I'm glad the chipmunk is gone. <laughs> so they wouldn't be able to swallow that hole, so they use their beak like a knife. They also have these impressive talons that they're going to use to help them grab their food. They're very powerful. She can grip really well with these. Good girl. Nice job. So these are very powerful talons. They're similar to our forks. They help hold on to their food while their beak is like a knife. The other, thing, the other thing that all of our raptors have in common is this incredible eyesight. Raptors have to have really amazing eyesight in order to hunt because their food is living. They have to be able to find it and catch it even though it's moving around very quickly. They all have incredible eyesight, but it varies in different ways. Some of them are really good at seeing things that are moving very quickly, like our falcons, because they are usually hunting things that are flying around or zipping around, like bugs. 
Our red-tailed hawks have amazing eyesight to see things that are very far away. So these guys, when they are soaring up in the sky, they're spreading their wings out, they can be soaring up as high as a mile up in the sky. And they're hunting a little animal that's down on the ground. So they have to be able to see something a mile away. And they're able to do this because they have binoculars built right into their eyes. They have binocular vision, so they can zoom in on something really far away or zoom in really close up with their eyesight. And you can kind of tell when Ruby's looking at something far away, she'll kind of go, you can see her adjusting. Good girl. And then, of course, the next animal that we're going to meet has amazing eyesight in an entirely different way to help it with its main strategy of hunting at night. So we are going to put Ruby back and meet that lady, another raptor friend. So if you guys want to, we have a special way that we say goodbye to our ambassadors at the Center for Wildlife. We try not to clap because that noise might startle them. So if you guys just want to do a little tiny, thank you, Ruby. Nice job, Ruby. Good girl. Oh yeah, this is a great opportunity to take a look at Ruby's beautiful red tail. That is how they get their name. Raise a nice hand if you guys saw a red-tailed hawk today. Nice job. <laughs> you got it. Jump right in your box. Good girl. They're super easy to see perched up high on the tops of rows. Ruby's a little dark for a red-tailed hawk. Usually their chest is a nice light color. Um, so if you see a big bird perched up in a tree with a nice light chest, that's a really good indication. You can also tell really easily when they're flying that it's a red-tailed hawk. They'll have a nice light underside to their wings like you saw on Ruby. And then you can usually see the underside of that red tail. So it's easy to differentiate them from another big raptor like a vulture or an eagle because they would be all black. But our red tails are going to be light on the underside. Our next friend is also a raptor, but these are our nocturnal raptor friends. Uh, this is a species that's also changed quite a bit. These guys actually used to be in danger, which is really interesting because now they're one of the most common species that we have of this type of animal. So we're going to meet Gaia, this lady came to us um, for a pretty uncommon reason. We get a lot of different animals, 2,000 animals about every year. 95% of them come to us because of some sort of human interaction, some interaction with people or some interaction that was caused indirectly by people. So getting hit by a car occurs to about half of our patients. Getting caught by a domestic cat or dog is another big one. Development concerns are another big one. This lady came to us for something that we would consider natural causes, something that could happen out in the wild without humans around. So this is actually pretty rare. This is not something that happens very often. Nine times out of ten, an animal is coming to us because of a human interaction, which is why we consider our work to be so vital and important. It's our way of dealing with all of those human-caused interactions. So we're going to meet this lady. I'm going to remind everybody about our being nice and quiet and sitting still rules. Good girl. Can you step up? Step up. You got it. Ever heard that if you find a baby bird, 
you can't touch it because its mom will smell you on that baby bird and reject that baby. Has anyone ever heard this before? This is an old wives' tale that I think got started by a parent who didn't want their kids running around touching baby birds, which is great, neither do we. But it's actually a really interesting myth because most of the time our birds have very limited senses of smell. Most of them don't use their smell at all. Great horned owls, for example, have a very limited sense of smell. Their favorite food is actually pretty indicative of this. Their favorite food is usually skunk. Skunk are big and slow, and they have a big warning stripe down their back that's supposed to be a warning stripe to predators on the ground to stay away, right? That's what they, that stripe is for. But to Gaia, it's like the golden arches. She can see that really well, that flash of bright white out there is really, really good, and she is able to hunt and catch those skunk with these amazing talons. She has giant talons. They have about a crushing power of about 300 pounds per square inch, um, so plenty to crush a, a skunk. And these guys will help us eat by eating all of those skunks that we don't want stinking up our neighborhoods. These guys have a very typical owl call, so if you've ever heard a very low, deep call of an owl, like a That's a great horse. We often mistake great horned owl calls uh, for morning dove calls. A lot of times we hear a morning dove and we go, oh, it's an owl, but it's actually a tiny little dove. Um, and there it goes. So very close, but different. Um, Gaia here came to us because she was um, injured in the nest by one of her siblings, I'm sure. With all the kids in here, we have some injuries that happen. Kids rough house, and so do little owlets. So uh, she broke one of her bones in her wing, her wrist here. She broke this, and um, by just being rough housed with with her siblings. So when her whole family went off and fledged and went to learn how to hunt in the summer, um, they all flew out of their nest, and Gaia here fell down to the bottom of the tree and was left behind. But luckily, the nest was in somebody's backyard. They had been paying attention, and they were able to bring her to us. And that's actually really beneficial for us. Getting a great horned owl as young as possible is very important if you would like to use that bird on education because they are so fierce. These guys are the top predators out there at night. There is very little that will go after a great horned owl. So they really want nice stuff. They really want to be able to be super, super uh, they really. All right. So Gaia here, uh, she will live with us with her mate Galileo at the Center for Wildlife. Our owls actually provide a really important service for us. Not only do they teach, we teach about 250, 300 education programs every year. Um, so she helps us achieve that goal, which is really important. But they also help us on our clinic side of things with our medical treatment of owlets. So we get in a lot of different species of owlet, but barred owls and great horned owls are the most common species of owls that we have around here. So we usually get those two species of owlets during the summer. We, uh, a couple summers ago, got three great horned owlets that got to live with Galileo and Gaia for the summer. They taught them all of the really important things that an owlet needs to know to be successful in the wild, like that call that I did, or how to look for food, who's a great horned owl, and who's a different kind of owl that you don't want to mess with. Um, so these are really important lessons that our owlets need to learn, and it's really important for us as people to teach that to them. They are super, super hard to train if, or teach any of that stuff to if you're a human. It's like being raised by a wolf. You would have no idea how to be a person. So we can put them in with Galileo and Guy, and they can foster those babies for us. And our barred owls we not can buy or in at the center are fostering a baby right now, a little baby owlet that will hopefully get out into the wild. So if you guys can tell, Gaia has these huge eyes in her head. Those are perfectly designed to help her see very, very well in the dark. We tend to focus a lot on owl vision because our eyesight is the main sense that we use to 
get around in the world, but their hearing is actually just as important as their eyesight. And in some ways, it's a little bit more important. Their eyes are designed to pick up on every little speck of light that's out there from every star, but sometimes it's overcast, or sometimes it's a new moon, so there's very little light out there for owls to hunt with. So they actually have hearing that is really exceptional to supplement when there isn't a lot of light outside. They've done studies with owls, whether they've put them in completely darkened rooms, so no source of light whatsoever. They've put a little obstacle short or course of fake trees or something, and they've let a little mouse loose. And that owl can catch that mouse 100% of the time, just using its hearing. Their ears are fantastic to help them hunt. They are shaped kind of like ours, which is really interesting. This keeps evolving again and again because it's a great shape to pick up on sound waves. So their ears are shaped like ours, the shell shape. And then they also have these additional feathers around their eyes that help to pick up noise as well. So you can see Gaia's circles around her eyes. Those are called her facial discs. And those act similar to if you guys have ever heard, had a hard time hearing something, you go like this, you cup your ear, and it helps things be a little bit louder. Those are what those do for her ears. Her ears are located right behind her eyes. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to put Gaia back, and we're going to meet this next this next friend. I also think I saw her in the room, so I want to make sure we get the raptors away. Good girl, Gaia. Nice job. Even though our gray horns are an apex predator, they're the top of the food chain, they still want to be camouflaged, so you can tell her beautiful feathers are wonderful camouflage for blending in with our trees. They want to do that so that they don't give away the location of their nests and so that their babies can be protected. you have a question? Of all of your, uh, your raptor patients, how many are able to actually go back? Yeah, so it depends on um, how old they are when we get them. So if they're a baby, sometimes we'll have more success than if they're an adult with an injury. It depends on why they were brought to us. So if it's a vehicle collision, that is usually something that's very hard to bounce back from. Um, if they are a baby, sometimes we have a more success if there's they just need to be raised. So it varies. Um, our general success rate overall is higher than the national average by about five percentage points. So about 40% of our patients are released into the wild. A oh, poor guy. He's going to be a, waiting for a while. I have some gloves if anyone wants to use some gloves or something to get him. We're going to move on to a non-raptor friend, probably a wise decision when there's a little critter running around. We're actually going to meet a critter just like that chipmunk, but much bigger. So we're going to meet a rodent. Um, our rodents are mammals, so they are just like us. They have fur, and they give birth to live babies, and they feed their babies milk, of course. This guy came to us for a pretty interesting reason. Hi. We're going to try to keep this tablecloth as nice as possible. Like the bark off of trees. 
So Henry came to us at the center because he was kidnapped. He was taken out of the wild as a tiny little porky pet. Somebody found him at the base of a tree where his mother had probably left him. They will leave their babies for most of the day and night down at the bottom of the tree. They're too small to climb. So they leave them there. They're born with their quills. So they're born with the ability to defend themselves. And moms can leave them on their own and they won't really be messed with too much. They're about the size of a softball when they're born and they're covered in little quills. So very little is going to try to mess with them. So mom will usually go up into the top of the tree to forage and leave her baby on his own. Um, so a hiker came across Henry and thought he was an orphan because he was by himself and she couldn't see mom up in the, up in the tree. Um, she was probably in some leaves. Um, and so she, they, took, they took Henry home with them and they tried to raise Henry on their own. Which um, they might not have had the intention of keeping him as a pet, they might have been trying to rehabilitate him, we don't know. But um, trying to raise baby animals if you are unsure of what to do is very, very difficult. Most of our animals really need to be um, left alone as much as possible, especially when they're babies. They can learn a lot of bad habits when they're being raised by people. So Henry here is very food motivated. He loves food. Most of our porcupines are always eating, always browsing because they are herbivores, so they need to eat a lot of roughage. So Henry is very food motivated. He learned very, very quickly that humans give you food, so you should really love humans. Um, so a lot of accidental positive reinforcement training went into Henry. Um, and now he loves people. He was a patient with us. He was kept with this woman for about six weeks. She brought him to us after that period and uh, dropped him off. And we had him for another six months in our care in our clinic trying to wild him out, trying to make him a wild porcupine again, because we are able to do that. Um, we tried to break the association between people and food by not really going in when we gave him food, trying to be as hands off as possible. We tried to clap our hands or stomp our feet to make him a little bit more fearful and he just totally ignored us. Um, he would actually open the door to his enclosure and welcome us in and he would try to climb in our laps. And he, uh, After six months of us doing this, our interns were so sad. They were like, please don't make us do this anymore. He is clearly not a wild porcupine. We, uh, we finally conceded and he was very, very grateful. We went in to sit with him and get, a, get to know him and he's he just climbed in our laps and snuggled with us. So he, he really is not a wild pork sign anymore. Um, and that has to do a lot with the way that he was raised. So a PSA for all of the babies that you guys might encounter out there. This is a big, hot time of year for babies. We have baby chipmunks, squirrels, woodchucks, all of these small baby mammals, um, as well as baby birds. Big PSA is to always Call us before you do anything. We have a wildlife assistance hotline that you can call and get advice on. Usually those babies are fine where they are. So um, that's our big our big thing with Henry to learn is that we should be as hands off as we can with a baby animal unless that baby animal is visibly injured. Um, usually mamas know what they're doing. Other animals that leave their babies on their own are bunnies. Baby bunnies are left on their own for most of the day. And baby uh, and deer, fawns, are left on their own for most of the day. Baby birds you see hopping around on the ground might be supposed to be on the ground. Um, they go through a natural stage of development where they have to hop around on the ground and build up their flight muscles before they can go off and be on their own. And mom and dad are usually still coming down and taking care of them. So as a porcupine, Henry, of course, has many, many quills that you can see here. His quills are his main form of defense. There's actually very little out there in the wild that will mess with a porcupine. There's one animal that is known to hunt porcupines. Um, you guys think you might know what that one animal would be? Fishers, very good. Fisher are the only animal crazy enough to go after a porcupine because these guys have 30,000 quills on their bodies that they're going to use to defend themselves, 30,000. They're mostly on their back, so they don't have any quills on their bellies, which is how a fisher cat can 
uh, can hunt them. They are both arboreal, so fishers can run up and down trees really quickly. These guys are a little bit slower. They have to go up the tree face up and down the tree bark first. So they can really climb as fast as a fisher. A fisher can knock them out of a tree, run down to the bottom and get to them on their bellies before they have a chance to flip back over and curl back up into a ball of quills. So our fisher are the only animal that will go after them. So these guys are pretty pretty well protected by all of these quills. And like I said, they are born with them. They're soft when they're born, and then about four hours after birth, they harden up and they're ready to go. As, a, as an animal that lives in our trees, a porcupine have to have a lot of great climbing abilities. So their hands are perfectly designed to help them climb. They have these long, sloth-like claws that fit right into the roots of tree bark and are very strong. They have little pads on the bottom of their hands that have little grippy bumps on them to help them grip onto the tree. And then their tail is a nice wedge shape. It has quills on the bottom that lock into the tree bark. They use that as an extra, as an extra foot or platform when they climb. So I'll try to show you guys his hands. Can you show off your hands? Well, he has fantastic little hands. Those are how he climbs very, very efficiently. In the winter time, these guys grow a big coat of fur. So you might see a porcupine and not really know what it is because it looks more like a little bear than a porcupine. They, their coat actually covers their quills. So a lot of times people aren't sure of what Henry is when I bring him around in the winter time. But then they lose it all in the spring, and they look like this for most of the year. I'm going to put Henry back, and we're going to meet our last buddy. Nice job, Henry. We just have to wait for him to finish his piece of sweet potato. These guys are herbivores, so they're, they're, another piece in the back. they're eating uh, mostly vegetables all year round. In the summer and spring, they're eating mostly leaves from trees. But in the fall, they get all of these goodies, like sweet potato and apple and acorns, things that are really, really full of fat. Are you going to get in here? Get in here. Oh, you got it. Come on. Let's go. Come on. You're getting distracted? You're OK. Let's go. Good boy, there you go. You have to get him to focus. That's all right. That's a challenge. All right. So we try to keep the mess contained to this towel. That's usually the way we're doing it. If you ever do come across a tree that needs to be rescued, don't use a towel to do so um, because the quills will all stick in the towel and it won't be good for the porcupine. But when it's just Henry sitting, usually the towel is not. So we're going to meet our last friend. We take care of all of our small mammals at the center, as well as our birds. We also get our local reptiles as well. We take in quite a few turtles this time of year. I'm sure you guys have seen turtles trying to cross roads or lay their eggs. We also get the occasional snake at the Center for Wildlife. Not too many. Most people don't want to rescue a snake, which is a shame because they're very, very important. But we get lots and lots of turtles. This is Clifford. Clifford is a box turtle. Box turtles are endangered in our state in Maine. They're pretty rare. These guys would usually occupy a nice little wetland area or a vernal pool habitat, someplace where there's water. They love to eat things like um, insect larvae that's laid in standing water. They love to eat tick larvae. So we love our, our box turtles. They are one of the many predators of ticks and mosquitoes and beetles, all of those little like bugs that we don't like. So conserving our little box turtles as well as some of our other turtle species like Blanding's turtles and wood turtles is really important for that pest control. It's really, really amazing. It's just like bats. Bats provide a lot of pest control for us by eating mosquitoes. These guys eat the ticks. 
So we really love them. Another animal that eats a lot of ticks are opossums. Opossums will groom the ticks off of themselves and eat them and pop them, pop them in the mouth like a piece of candy if they find one. So they're not like flushing them down the toilet. They're actually eating them. Um, so lots of our wildlife eat ticks as a food source. So helping those guys out will help us definitely. That's why we call a lot of the times we will refer to our organization as being concerned with wildlife medicine or conservation medicine. We talk a lot about ecosystem services, so the services that our wildlife provide for us for free, like the USDA estimating that bats provide about $3 billion worth of pest control every year for us. Um, we love to talk about things like that. That is really, we get a lot of people saying, well, why should we do this? Why should we care? That's why. They are very cute, and our instinct is to help out the cute things, but there's actually a huge financial benefit to helping for wildlife, and that's really how we get those business <laughs> So, Clifford here was also taken out of the wild. He's about actually 40 years old. Um, he's been a pet for that whole time. Somebody took him out of the wild as a baby. They're about the size of a quarter when they are hatched out of their eggs, so people find them. I'm sure some of you guys might remember collecting them or putting them in a bucket. So some people used to do this. Fortunately now, because they are endangered, they're protected, they can't, that can't happen anymore. But lots of folks used to have box turtles, painted turtles, all of these species of turtles as pets because they are cute and they don't shed. And so if you have allergies, sometimes it's a good alternative. But the main reason to not have a turtle as a pet, does anyone know why you don't want to have a turtle as a pet? Why might this cute little guy not not make a good pet? Water. Oh, maybe because it lives in water. So these guys are a terrestrial turtle. They live on land, but they like to live near water. But a lot of turtles do need a big tank of water. Our painted turtles have to live in, and then you have to clean it. And the whole thing. Does anyone know why we wouldn't want to have a turtle as a pet? Because they eat ticks, and probably not going to want to go outside. Oh yeah. yeah. So we we fortunately can give them things other than ticks that they like to eat, like worms and things. That's a good guess. You want to go out collecting ticks. I'll tell you, I'll give you a hint. Remember I said he was 40 years old? Do you think you might know? Uh, well, I, maybe because he's endangered or too That's a That's a good reason. So we can't have them because they're endangered. These guys live to be, these guys live to be about 100 years old in the wild. So in captivity, they might live even longer. Um, so these guys are incredibly long-lived. You would probably not live as long as your box turtle pet. Um, Clifford is 40. We have three other box turtles that are around the same age and we'll have them for a long time. So these guys don't make the best pets because of their long lifespan. And this is generally true of our reptiles. Most of our reptiles don't make great pets because they live for a long time. It has to do with being a cold-blooded animal. So Clifford has been a pet for so long, and he is such a good boy that he will let anyone that is interested pet him. He is really, really sweet, and obviously not afraid of very much. Um, we can pet his shell or his back feet. Let's just stay away from his head. Um, but if you guys would like to come up and pet Clifford, you are more than welcome to. You guys were a fantastic audience. Thank you so much. is in some place that you